Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, this training workshop, which will focus on uh, anti money laundering and financial crime responsibilities, particularly aimed at uh, those of you who are either in or will be moving into the key role of senior management function 17, which is the money laundering reporting officer role, which, as you know, is a mandatory requirement from the, uh, the FCA. <clears throat> um, so that's the, the focus of, uh, of the training today, looking through the eyes of, of the SMF 17. Uh, and I know that those of you on the call are probably experienced in this role, so it will be somewhat of a refresher for you. And you're probably on the call because you want to be cascading some of this information down to the, uh, the teams or the people that you're responsible for. <clears throat> it may well be that we've got some people on call who are not SMF 17s. So that's not a problem at all. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, content that will be equally valuable to you. Um, OK, so we're scheduled to run for up to uh, an hour and a half. I don't think it will take us quite that long. But for those of you who need to, uh, to crack on and do your IFAC uh, money laundering test, um, there'll be sufficient time at the end of this workshop for you to, uh, to, to get onto the, the BAT system and get that out of the way. <clears throat> so if anybody who's concerned about that test, let me just try and lay those fears right here, right now. Um, I'm confident that everything that you need to know and understand in order to be successful in that particular uh, test, we were going to cover today in this training session in uh, in full. Um, I went on to it uh, to the, the system yesterday evening, uh, did the test just to make sure, uh, and I'm very comfortable that we're going to get you all into a place for those of you who need to to be successful in that particular test. So, without any further ado, let me uh, let me crack on then, and let's begin as usual, by looking at what we're looking to uh, to achieve today um, by way of learning objectives. So as I said, really, we're going to look through the eyes of the SMF 17 and understand really what the responsibilities and accountabilities are, uh, if you're fulfilling that role. <clears throat> and then just broaden out from uh, money laundering into kind of terrorist financing legislation as well. Which, as you'll see as we go through the uh, the training, the uh, the government and the authorities have, have, have kind of aligned the two. They've brought these two together because there was there was overlap. Then just a refresher, I'm sure, on customer due diligence and enhanced due diligence, what the requirements are, and again, just refreshing our memories on things like HEPs, <laughs> potentially exposed people. And then looking at how we uh, might start to recognise uh, elements of suspicious activity, what might be some uh, particular trigger points, not necessarily for, for you in your role, but how you can educate the people that you're working with to, um, to spot maybe some clusters that would uh, lead them to report, report it to you in the first instance. And then just at the end of the workshop, just broadening right out from AML and terrorist financing into a, an overview of some of the other financial crime offences that really, when you're sitting in, in your role, it's helpful to, uh, to just have a, 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 an understanding of, a working knowledge of. So that's kind of how the uh, the training is structured. That's the, um, the track we'll be following. So, as I said, as part of my uh, opening comments, really, uh, you must, uh, anybody working in financial services in the advisory space, it's not optional. The FCA said that there must be a money laundering reporting officer. Yeah. <clears throat> Even if you're a sole trader, one of the hats that you need to wear, obviously, is this role of, of SMF 17. And you really, as you know, there to make sure that everything is as it needs to be within the firm to, in, to make sure you're complying with all the relevant legislation, whether that's money laundering or financial crime. And they've got systems, processes, controls in place that are being monitored 
so that you are proactively, it can evidence that you're proactively playing your part in trying to identify any criminal activity. <clears throat> the other essential role of an SF17, of course, is to be the focal point for um, this type of activity within the firm. So basically, you know, when it comes to money laundering, in the first instance, if there's some suspicious activity that needs to be reported, obviously a member of your team comes to you as the MLRO in the first instance. So that must be kind of clear to everybody. And as I say, you're, you're really giving oversight on behalf of the business. <clears throat> Now, the FCA do re regard this as a really critical role. That's why it's a mandatory role. And they basically insist that uh, you are authorised before you can get on and actually perform the role. So seriously do they take it. Um, so again, some of you on the call may well be working with IFAC at the moment, going through that process of which this is a, a key part in terms of evidencing <coughs> your knowledge, skills and competency to do the role. <clears throat> but one of the checks and balances that the FCA uh, undertake is to make sure that anybody who um, fulfills this role has got not only the appropriate knowledge and skills, but that level of experience that they feel is required because it does carry with it quite a significant amount of responsibility under the senior managers regime that we'll explore in more detail in, in a moment. Now, hopefully, within the, uh, the handbook, the FCA have actually given us some, some definitions around the SMF 17 role. Basically, what it's saying that the money laundering reporting officer should, as you'd expect, make sure that, you know, the, 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 within the firm, everything is, is being compliantly uh, run in line with um, AML the controls are in place. They again reference the fact that not only do you need to have sufficient authority, but sufficient independence uh, within the firm, because you may have to, to challenge uh, things that are going on, and also uh, access to whatever resources that you need in order for, to fulfil your role. Oh, sure. now, for those of you like me who are a sole trader, you might be rolling your eyes at that and thinking, well, I am. Yeah, I've, I've opened mine up, um, and I can see... Oh, hang on. Okay. Let me just... Okay. Sorry about that, folks. I think somebody's corrected themselves in terms of, uh, of muting their microphone there. <clears throat> uh, also that, you know, you've got uh, sufficient uh, MI, uh, dashboard, uh, reports, uh, and access to them that, uh, that means you've got sufficient um, information and data, MI, to carry out your role and again link into this expertise and experience point that you can deal with the information so you've got that capacity uh, and experience to deal with that and exercise your judgment if you receive information or suspicions on money laundering <clears throat> You're also uh, obliged by law to report any suspicions of uh, money laundering, as you know, to the National Crime Agency. And we'll look at that in more detail in, in just a moment. <clears throat> so, again, I'm, I'm conscious that for a lot of you on, on the call, this will be a refresher. But, you know, SMF 17, this all, was all brought about by a change to bring about senior management function roles into the advisory space. We're all used to that now. We kind of came a little bit late to the party after the big banks and insurers, but it's kind of well embedded in our firms now. <clears throat> so as you know, every SMF role, of which 17 is one, we have to have a statement of responsibilities, which just frames what the role is, what the accountabilities are. And that is relatively generic. It's around you know, being part of the senior leadership team, being a director of the business, um, uh, and actually having the requisite responsibilities and accountabilities that go with that. <clears throat> and then you've got this, this piece around prescribed responsibilities, which actually is much more role specific. So this will be the responsibilities that you're on the hook for, basically, as the SMF 17. 
And again, for those of you who are going through the application process to be authorized as an SNF 17, this is a, a very much what the FCA will be wanting to see in your um, application, the generic statement of responsibilities and then the prescri prescribed responsibilities that, uh, that you are going to be held accountable for by them and by the firm. Because, because you ultimately have a duty of responsibility. So if for whatever reason, the firm breaches the FCA requirements around money laundering in this particular case or wider because of your statement of responsibilities, then both the firm and you could self as the accountable individual will be uh, <clears throat> will be responsible for your kind of uh, judgment and behavior to uh, to the FCA. So that's why they insist that uh, the individuals who fulfill these roles have got appropriate experience, have got all the right knowledge and skills to be able to execute the role because with the role comes relatively significant kind of responsibilities and accountabilities. <clears throat> now, the FCA will never be prescriptive, as you know, if, uh, if, if you work them for any length of time, they work on kind of principles. But in terms of some of the best practice we've seen at, at IFAC and, and wider, what kind of statements would you expect to see in the prescribed responsibilities part of the application? For those of you who are already in role and you know this is just kind of meat drink to you, just as a, a check and balance might be worth going into your uh, statement uh, prescribed responsibilities, just making sure that you're comfortable that you're covering all bases in there. So we know surprises here. It's all common sense stuff. You'd expect when you sit in this role to be responsible not only for owning the control systems to prevent uh, violations, but also to be at the forefront of developing the policies and, uh, and systems and controls as well. So these things shouldn't be set in aspect. You should be reviewing them on an annual basis and then looking at, you know, how how you're doing really in terms of what enhancements if any need to be made the other thing that you do as i say this one for me all rows lead to you in terms of being the mlro so you know you need to take the lead on this so you know you know giving management across to the senior management team across to your fellow directors uh, in terms of the latest uh, developments and any changes that they're coming through, but also to be entirely confident that any people within the business and employees and staff uh, and advisors are totally kind of cognizant of the need to um, uh, adhere to money laundering regulations uh, and what that entails, and importantly, how to report any suspicions that they might have. <clears throat> Again, I think from a best practice point of view, this isn't a role where you kind of sit back and, and wait for it to happen. I think you need to uh, be on the front foot in terms of proactivity and trying to spot any situations that you, you that may pose a risk from a money laundering perspective. And once again, act as the, uh, the wise sort of sage really in terms of managing the business, guiding management and colleagues, just to make sure that, um, as I say, your, your processes, controls, um, MI gathering is, is where it needs to be and what lessons are being learned. <clears throat> of course, as I say, day to day, all roads lead to you in terms of money laundering, but critically, you're the one that takes the lead in this role in terms of where you need to either report uh, internally, at least annually to the, uh, the board or, or fellow directors, um, or take the lead in uh, reporting suspicions to the National Crime Agency and liaising with law enforcement and external authorities such as the FCA when and if um, money laundering suspicions arise. And then you should be uh, comfortable that uh, sufficient monitoring is in place to uh, to measure the risks um, of money laundering 
from your internal uh, systems, controls and procedures, and that you're sitting on top of that. You're probably getting them to report on a monthly or quarterly basis and sign that off. And as I say, you are responsible for, for reporting your uh, suspicions. <clears throat> so all we've done so far, really, is we've just kind of uh, reminded ourselves if we're in role that um, this, this role isn't a gimmick. It's quite a, a big deal, really, in terms of senior management functions. It's one of the two roles only that need to be signed off by the, uh, the FCA. For some of us on the call, uh, that's just a refresher. So, you know, here we are. For others on the call, that will be uh, part of why you probably think the, um, the process is quite onerous in terms of working with IFAC to get you accredited there as an SMF 17. <clears throat> so what is money laundering then? Well, <clears throat> money laundering isn't necessarily um, something that happens when a transaction takes place. It's broader than that. It could also be when a relationship is formed that involves crime and any form of property. So again, let's just broaden that out again in terms of the definition of property. So property is basically anything and everything you can think of. A lot of people associate money laundering with kind of wads of, uh, of cash. In reality, uh, it's a much, much broader than that. There's lots of white collar money laundering these days with um, bearer bonds, certificates of deposit, maybe deeds to office blocks, residential properties. So it hasn't got to be a tangible physical asset. It could act, property could actually be defined as legal papers that give title to such assets. So what we can see there in terms of money law, the definition is, is quite broad. You know, it's about proceeds of crime and, and any kind of property, basically, you could you could identify. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> it, it not only includes uh, money and assets that are obtained criminally uh, and exchanged for money, but also, as, as we've gone through the money laundering process, assets that are apparently at this moment in time clean with no obvious link to criminal activity, because as we will see as we go through the training, that's really the end game. You know, the whole aim of money laundering is to make the assets look clean. But what, uh, what this is saying is that even where assets on the face value look clean, we've got to be satisfied through our due diligence and audit processes that they haven't come from uh, an illicit source. So started to talk about this then, why bother, why go through the process of money laundering? It's basically so that the, uh, the criminals can uh, get the assets into the legitimate financial system, yeah? So that they can actually um, benefit from their kind of criminal activity and participate in the legitimate economy because not just our industry, but every kind of industry, particularly in the UK, we're quite strong in this uh, field. You know, gone are the days where you can really, you know, drop a whole wheelbarrow full of money down in a, in a car showroom uh, and drive out in a brand new car. You know, the dealership um, are unhappy to take uh, big, big wadges of, of cash. So they would expect that money to come from a bank transfer or by a um, banker's draft or something like that. So in order to drive around in your shiny German metal or whatever, you need to have legitimized the funds and got them into the system. Yeah. <clears throat> Same for the purchase of any other kind of asset that you can think about. Um, the whole uh, basis of my laundering is trying to clean uh, illicit funds gained from criminal activity. <clears throat> now, money laundering regulations have been around for quite a while now. I mean, go right back to the 90s and look at where we first came across some money laundering regulation. And since the 90s, a whole raft of legislation has followed. 
Now, the good news for you is, uh, particularly if you're concerned about the, uh, the test later as well, you don't need to uh, be able to recite the different uh, acts uh, and the date for the company. <clears throat> but it's fair to say that that uh, Proceeds of Crime Act, POCA, uh, 2002 is is kind of still alive and well. and We'll unpack that in a little bit more detail later on in the training. <clears throat> but as you can see, formally introduced money laundering regulations specifically uh, in 2007, but then subsequently it's been broadened out to include uh, terrorist financing as well. Uh, and the, the latest act that we're all, uh, living with at the moment was the uh, money laundering and terror and finance regs, which came into force in January a couple of years ago. <clears throat> in terms of money laundering authorities, well, as, as you know, uh, money laundering is an international problem. It's not, not something that's specific to the UK. And given where we are with technology these days, it's very easy to flow funds across uh, geographies, across international borders, through different countries. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, the international authorities um, have, have created, so this is kind of big uh, developed nations, if you like, and have, have put together something called a financial action task force, which is, uh, you know, aims on an international front to uh, identify and stamp out money laundering, um, which it's doing kind of with mixed success at the moment. Uh, in terms of the UK, the governor of the Bank of England actually sits as a member of that international regulator. So you can see that we do take it extremely seriously in this, uh, this country. In the UK, the main regulator of money laundering is, is the FCA, uh, and it takes its guide from notes published by the Joint Money Laundering Steering Group, again, and that group is made up of uh, high profile figures from within financial services industry. Uh, and, and they, uh, the great and the good, give their views and, and produce guidance notes. And the FCA kind of operationalize that and push that out into, into our sector. Where you've reported some sus suspicious activity, then, as you know, that goes into the National Crime Agency, but then broader than that, uh, HMRC could get involved, the FCA could get involved. Indeed, it could come out to things like serious fraud office and the police, depending on where we need to go to get to the bottom of what's happening. And the actual enforcement very much belongs to National Crime Agency and serious fraud office. So they're there to uh make judgment calls about whether or not to uh, to take uh criminals to court and the basis on which they're going to do that <clears throat> so if we drop down into kind of firm level now what do those regulations actually require of us if we distill it all down okay well as i've already said many times this is about us practice Typically saying, right, have we got the right systems and controls in place, basically to mitigate any risk that they might be used, the, the funds that are coming in to further financial crime, or if you're in the kind of uh, mortgage space, you know, are, are they, uh, the properties being used to, uh, to shelter some, uh, some illicit funds? <clears throat> So in, in the usual way, how the FCA work, if, uh, if they can't see it, it doesn't exist. Um, so they're expecting to, you to have documented processes in place, evidence on a day-to-day -day basis you're uh, looking for and uh, mitigating risk of money laundering. And I know for those of you on, on call who take advantage of the IFAC annual audit um, service, that would be one of the areas that they would look at with you to make sure that everything is where it needs to be. <clears throat> the other thing is that uh, it, it would require you to have the right level of staff training in place. So the fact that you're on this workshop uh, today, this training course, well done for that. You're evidencing it and you'll be able to evidence it that you've attended this course 
but also some of you on the course might feel that you want to cascade some of this training down and uh, you know it's it's good to have all staff refreshed at least on a on an annual basis it also requires you to keep as you know i think this is really well baked into our processes now where you've done your id where you've done your verification checks we have to hang on to those records now and as you know we need to keep them for five years after the end of the relationship <clears throat> And as we've already said, there needs to be a money laundering reporting officer, SMF 17 in the new kind of uh, lingo of senior managers regime, acting as a focus for money laundering activity, who has overall responsibility for anti-money laundering and financial crime. And you are required, at least on an annual basis, as I've already said, to report on the overall effectiveness of your checks and balances, processes and controls. Um, depending on your firm, it'll be firm specific. It could be at a board meeting. It could be in a smaller business like my own. You kind of make, you know, you can get some minutes and, uh, and, and make sure that they're all pulled together. Again, that's something that's part of your annual audit. The IFAC uh, team would, would check for. <clears throat> So again, at firm level, I'm not going to kind of uh, dwell too much on this. As I say, I think this is very well baked into our processes now. So we're all used to not only in the advisory space or in the kind of back office space, but as consumers uh, at width of financial services as well, actually uh, proving our identity. So, you know, that's that's all fine and dandy. And we all know whatever that whatever checks need to be made you can't actually get on and do the business until all the checks are complete and of course the serious uh, sorry the suspicious activity report is, is another way you can control and monitor what's going on <clears throat> so as you know i'm not going to dwell on this we need to keep all documents that relate to financial transactions to client identity and your annual internal audits and reviews of your anti organ processes, uh, and they should be uh, in, in a state where uh, anybody could come in and, and look at those and you could evidence that that's working. <clears throat> so as we know, everybody in financial services has got a key role to play. In fact, they're obliged by legislation to actively work to combat money laundering. So whilst, as I said, you don't need to memorise the legislation, at a base level, you are expected to understand what money laundering and terrorist financing is. Yeah, how those offences affect you in your role as SMF seventeen, and how they affect wider than that the firm and the individuals who are working within the firm. It's critical that you know, and I know you do, that you have to uh, verify identity. It's a legal requirement before any business is transacted, and not only how to recognize suspicious activity, but how to make a report as well. So I'm conscious there that uh, I really haven't, I guess, told you anything you, you don't know about money laundering. And I think that thread will continue because you're probably more expert in this than, uh, than myself. We know that money laundering has, has three stages. Um, the first stage is where the criminals are wanting to uh, get uh, assets into the, uh, the system. Now, uh, for those of you who've uh, been on training with me before will know I'm a, I'm a Netflix streamer. And one of the series I've been watching on Netflix is something called Ozark. Uh, and the only reason I mention that is the whole kind of um, series is predicated on and around money laundering. So we've got a Mexican drug cartel who are, you know, awash with, with cash from their illicit activities. And they are trying to place huge volumes of cash legitimately into the financial system. So long story short, they've, um, they've got hold of uh, somebody called Marty, who they're uh, kind of blackmailing. And Marty is expert in uh, 
um, getting money into the system. So he's done things like bought casinos, bought hotels, bought stud farms to uh, invest these illicit kind of funds into. <clears throat> and the next step is to try and really confuse, obfuscate, uh, blur were that uh, you know the source of of the funds and that's known as you know as as layering so this is where uh, what marty's doing now is he's washed some dirty money through a casino the casino now looks like clean money and he's going to buy legitimate assets with that clean money so he's buying things like shopping malls in the in the states with what looks like kind of clean money. <clears throat> and then kind of the third and final stage of the, uh, the process is where the criminals want to, uh, are in a position to, to make it look like they have got legitimate funds from a legitimate source. And as I said earlier, that's critical for them because it's at that point they can actually start to fully uh, enjoy want of a better word, the proceeds of their illicit activities, you know, and to, to, to buy uh, whatever it is that uh, Mexican drug dealers would want to buy in that particular um, example. <clears throat> so that's the three stages of money laundering, placement, getting it into the system in the first place, layering it to try and confuse uh, authorities or people such as yourselves who are trying to look at where the source of the funds actually originated and then to fully integrate it into the system so that they can write out a check for that German metal. They can purchase the, the house and all the trappings that kind of go with that. Excuse me, quick slip. Now, I said we would come back to the uh, the proceeds of Crime Act, as we were looking through, um, because the proceeds of Crime Act actually started in the first instance to introduce some money laundering offences and to suggest some uh, some punishments that would go with these offences if people were were found guilty of uh, of being associated with any of these. Again, for the vast majority, if not everybody on the call, I'm sure this is just a refresher. So, as you know. We've got tipping off, assisting and failing to report. And we're going to just unpack each of those in a little bit more detail now. <clears throat> so as you know, tipping off is where a person um, actually, even if it's inadvertently, uh, informs somebody who is suspected of money laundering that they may be under investigation. Yeah. So if we bring it into uh, to our world, it could be that we've got a client who's under suspicion and in, in all innocence, one of our um, back office staff or advisors says uh, they want to withdraw. I can't actually do that for you at the moment because you know, you're under investigation. <laughs> um, that, would, uh, that would not be good, even if it was inadvertent. That would be a, a tipping off offence. And, and that uh, would uh, trigger potentially depending on the circumstances, a custodial sentence of up to five years, as well as an unlimited fine. Yeah, and that fine could be levied on both the firm and the individual. <clears throat> the other and much more serious uh, offence in the eyes of the law is if you are involved in uh, assisting criminal activity because you are uh, complicit, in trying to convert or, or transfer money. So you're in that kind of uh, integration, uh, layering phase of the process, and you're working with criminals, trying to conceal and disguise that. <clears throat> Obviously, that makes you much more complicit, even if you're acting uh, under duress. Uh, and, and the custodial sentence uh, reflects that because the imprisonment there moves up to a maximum of 14 years, as well as the unlimited fine. <clears throat> and then this is one that I say uh, should should never happen. It's uh, it's almost like a, a, an optional one, failing to report. 
So if anybody ever has any suspicions, and this is, I think is a key point that you have to get over to your staff, yeah, even if you just suspect that money laundering is, is occurring, then always better to report it and give somebody the benefit of the doubt, yeah? Because if you fail to report, you too could be drawn into the, uh, the investigation. And once again, just as with tipping off, uh, that could result in a custodial sentence of up to five years, as well as an unlimited fine. <clears throat> okay, so in that last section, all we've done really is we've looked at the definition of money laundering. We said it's quite a broad brush piece. It's not just around assets, it's about relationships as well. And we've said the definition of assets is actually very wide. It doesn't have to be something physical. It could be something like um, uh, deeds. It could be uh, anything paper-based that says you're entitled to hold assets. <clears throat> we had a quick look at some of the overarching legislation, and then we sort of looked at what that meant for firms. And then we've just had a look at the three uh, elements of money laundering. And... Then we've looked at things like uh, tipping off, etc., and the um, sentences, the custodial sentences that go with that. So that should all be very uh, familiar ground to uh, to everybody. And I think this will continue in that vein in terms of uh, familiar ground. So we're going to start to take a look at customer due diligence. Now. Yeah, the big tick. Okay, just trying to find the source of that uh, audio accompaniment. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, customer due diligence, um, four main elements to, uh, to this. This is about you and your, your teams having the, the radar, really. <clears throat> so in terms of consumer or customer due diligence, um, you know, this is a judgment call, really. You have to make a risk assessment based on your knowledge and understanding of the client, the source of the funds, and um, the uh, environment in which uh, you're operating in to determine the level of due diligence you require, whether it's the standard or whether you need to go for enhanced due diligence. Okay, it's Malwinder, is it? Okay, let me try and find that. Good call, thank you. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, done it. Thank you. Thank you for the tip. <laughs> uh, right. So let's get uh, let's get back to customer due diligence then. So an, an element of a judgment call, really, by way of a risk assessment, and that's something that uh, you can uh, very much uh, help your advisors, back office stuff with in terms of uh, determining the level of risk. Making sure, of course, we verify the client's identity. As I said, that's very well baked into our systems these days. <clears throat> For those of us who work in the advisory space or uh, and your advisors, it's about when they're going through the fact find process and, and doing all the, uh, the know your client piece, just being aware of anything that might um, you know, words and music not being right may give rise to suspicion. <clears throat> and to just bear in mind that when it comes to customer due diligence, it's not a one-off exercise. It's not something that happens just at the start of the relationship with a client before we get into that. It was something we need to be cognizant of ongoing throughout the client journey, client relationship, at the different touch points that we have with them. <clears throat> Now, as part of that risk assessment, you may feel that you need to do some enhanced uh, due diligence because for whatever reason you deem the business is at higher risk. It could be something as, as simple, and it's happened a lot, COVID and post-COVID, where 
we're doing uh, business uh, virtually sometimes and the client isn't physically present. So it, it may be that you want to do additional verification checks around identity, address, etc. And always, always, where someone is regarded as a politically exposed person, then you do definitely need to do enhanced consumer due diligence. <clears throat> so as you know, if you move into that because you've deemed it to be a higher risk, you have to do one or more additional checks. And again, I'd say at least one, dependent on the case, if you're case specific, you may feel that you want to do more than this. So you'll need to do some additional identification checks. It may be that you'll want to go wider than that and look for evidence and documentation from other financial institutions who are subject to the same or similar money laundering directives. <clears throat> and you'll need to uh, maybe satisfy yourself on the source of the funds. Why? Because of everything we've just looked at in terms of money laundering. Is this part of a journey to integrate uh, and, and layer, uh, layer and integrate funds into the system? So I was working, I've been working with uh, an IFA uh, and um, this is a, a real life case where they um, have a client who's relocated from uh, Canada to the UK. Uh, he, he's relocating, his parents had emigrated to Canada um, when he was a young child. Um, they got a house and other assets in Canada. Now that they're deceased, he's decided to come uh, and relocate back to the, the UK. And he was moving assets back from Canada into the UK. So <clears throat> the, um, the IFA has done a lot of uh, kind of due diligence in this before they've um, got into the financial relationship. Lots of verification and certification of documents from banks and other institutions in Canada. Uh, which is good, it's a developed country, so they, they also subject to money laundering directives. And they've been able to establish sorts of funds to their satisfaction. So this is from the sale of a property in Canada and other assets. So that was it's a real life. You don't see enhanced due diligence that often, but that was uh, that's happened within the course of the, the last year for a firm that I've been working with. So source of the funds, source of the wealth, um, are you satisfied when you go back and do an audit trail that you know where these uh, funds have come from? <clears throat> and the other thing you could do is to make sure that any uh, monies that are received is coming from an account in the client's name, which might sound uh, obvious, um, but also from a financial institution who, who similarly are subject to money laundering directives and legislation. Yeah. <clears throat> Where you feel that you're unable to, uh, to satisfy yourself, then there are uh, agencies that exist that you could uh, utilize to get independent intelligence to satisfy yourself. Or of course, you could decide that it is too high risk for you and you want to walk away. You always do enhance due diligence if someone is a politically exposed per person, excuse me, and I think we all know this, but just as a reminder, these are individuals who have had, within the, the past 12 months, either a high political profile or they've had high office in a political or public function. But also, interestingly, it's not just those individuals. It also includes members of their immediate family and close associates. <clears throat> As you know, the rationale for this is these people are in, in uh, positions of influence. Uh, it could be that, um, you know, in certain regimes, there has been uh, evidence of kind of, of uh, corruption and people getting hold of, uh, of assets that they, strictly speaking, shouldn't have. Also, people in these kind of high profile roles are susceptible both themselves and from their family members and associates of being held to, to blackmail by criminal gangs and fraternities and uh, to get them to do things that they wouldn't otherwise necessarily do. <clears throat> so who would constitute uh, a pet? Uh, as I say, people, if you can see from, from the list there, I'm not going to go through it uh, line by line, 
are basically high offices of government, high offices of the judiciary, and um, any um, big jobs, directorships, or sitting on uh, supervisory boards of big state enterprises or international organisations. These sorts of people would almost certainly, uh, you know, the red flag would be it would be fluttering if they were doing business with your with your firm. Is I would suggest that for most of us day to day, it would be a little bit out of the ordinary. I know a lot of uh, of advisory firms don't just uh, deal in the kind of personal markets; they deal in the corporate markets as well, which is uh, which is great. If you're dealing with a company that's on the stock exchange, uh, and that would include things like the uh, the alternative investment market, then the good news for you is that there's no further identification needed because they've wanted to through, jump through a number of very stringent hoops to get onto the exchange in the first um, instance. <clears throat> also, and probably more realistically, where you're dealing with a local business, a private company or a partnership, where one or more of the directors are known to the advisor. Again, no further identification is required. Where clients are unknown, corporate clients, then it's not too onerous. It's about doing a you know relevant credit searches, bank references, and doing what you need to do to verify the identity of the directors and partners, making sure they are who they say they are, they live where they say they live, um, and they're not kind of shadow directors, which may be a trigger for is there some untoward kind of criminal activity here. <clears throat> For those of you who uh, work with the uh, not, not profit sector, so charities or, or collective investment schemes, then again, it's relatively uh, straightforward to identify uh, individuals and um, bodies because there's industry directories or, you know, there are specialist consultants who can uh, provide references in the charities or pension sector. <clears throat> So in terms of uh, suspicious activity, um, yes, uh, good question. Uh, listed companies on the European Stock Exchange would be similarly covered because uh, you know, they're, they're regulated in a similar way. This is something I think in your role, you can really uh, help your, your firm with, particularly those in the kind of the advisory space or the back office space, power planners or back office who are involved in some of the processing activity. <clears throat> so none of these is kind of set in stone. They're just markers and indicators that as part of your training and education of people in money laundering, you can just kind of bring it alive and make people aware of. Yeah. <clears throat> so in terms of suspicious activity, you know, it's a people business that we're we're in. If you know we're so used to uh, to getting ID and processing ID and, uh, these days, if anything doesn't look right, then uh, you know because it's it looks like it's been fraudulently obtained or it's not actually theirs, um, then that should should ring some bells. Yeah, <clears throat> we all know there's there's a kind of a a flow a rhythm to uh, the process, the advisory process of the initial meeting, probably moving into a fact find and that two way exchange of information. If a client, for whatever reason, seems to be unwilling to provide relatively basic information, very secretive, yeah, that again, not saying that's a, a gimme in terms of the money laundering activities going on, but again, it's about building a picture why would they be secretive? What are the underlying factors there? Is it something that I need to be worried about? <clears throat> if somebody is just in a, in a hurry to get on with it and trying to apply pressure, you know, without wanting to give you all the information or all the answers that you need, can we just get on with it, please? I don't want to talk about X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> or if they're asking or trying to encourage you to do something that, you know, again, it doesn't follow the normal kind of flow and pattern. It's not part of how we normally do business. 
they just want to crack on a bit. <clears throat> and you know, money laundering is uh, requires a consistency because if people are uh, not giving the full truth, it's easy for them to trip themselves over. So they might be inconsistent with the information that they're providing. They might contradict something they've said earlier because they've forgotten what they've said. <clears throat> and it could be uh, that they don't really pay any attention to either the advisory fee that's being uh, paid to the product and fee charges, um, the fact that you know they could maybe get it at a more competitive rate elsewhere. Um, all these things from a people perspective may alert you to, uh, to the fact that there might be something untoward going on. Combine that then with uh, suspicious activity around transactions. So this could be unexpected changes, last minute requests, um, asking you to do things that don't appear to be in line with their risk appetite or they've given you what their long term objectives are. And they're now asking you to make transactions that are, are uh, not congruent with that. So somebody's put quarter of a million quid into uh, an investment bond and, and a month later they're trying to take 50, 100, 150 out, you know, uh, and the market's gone down, blah, blah, blah. So why, why is that? <clears throat> that they keep going in and out of the uh, the market, buying and selling, buying and selling, kind of irrespective of uh, of market conditions. Now, it might be totally legitimate. They might have some sort of investment strategy, but <clears throat> that could be another trigger, an indicator of their looking to layer funds through the system. And the source of funds is coming from lots of different sources. So you know. Some people have, you know, a, a, a handful of different accounts. But if, if money seems to be coming in from all sorts of different places, that again might be a trigger. <clears throat> and for those of you who work in the uh, mortgage space, you know, have you got an, um, evidence from the mortgage statement that, you know, there's lots of uh, capital redemptions going on, money going in, then they might have a further advance and take money out, you know, similarly with a bank's statement is a lots of in and out is a can you match them up <clears throat> and is any funds flowing from countries where on face value the client doesn't have any known connection so this is, goes back to my um comments about money laundering and international business these days so as some money flow across into the uk to this individual and they're now trying to get it into the system and again Maybe cancel investments uh, quickly, uh, asking for a refund of contributions. So that's people, transactions. Also, <clears throat> similar to the, the, the people part, really, but is there no legitimate relationship for reason for the relationship? So, you know, I, as an IFA, would be very uh, wary if I was based, uh, I'm based in uh, Gloucestershire. If somebody up in Cumbria contacted my office with a view to doing business with me as an IFA, you know, why does somebody in a totally different area want to contact me out of the blue and do business with me? Might be totally legitimate, might be relocating, they might have relatives here, whatever. Not saying this means they're money laundering, it's merely a flag or a trigger that you uh, would sort of rouse, I would suggest, some sort of suspicion. Is there something unusual or not quite right uh, with the kind of activity that uh, that's happening compared to what you know about a client? You know, so on face value, they've told you they work nine to five in office, but they're frequently spending long periods abroad. Uh, you know, and there doesn't seem to be uh, be a problem in terms of the amount of time they're taking out. Is there any element of um, sub subterfuge, really? So who's really in control? This uh, is more to the fore for those of you who work in the corporate sector, where there might be shadow directors or people behind the scenes, maybe, pulling the strings, and they're really in control. <clears throat> Do they hold offshore accounts? Are they purchasing things to offshore trusts? 
and entities that don't kind of make sense. <clears throat> As I say, when we're in the advisory space, things tend to follow a pattern and rhythm. And, you know, we get familiar with a, with a typical type of arrangement people in certain situations have in place. So in your professional opinion, do the arrangements seem much more complicated than they need to be for the business that's being transacted? <clears throat> and is there a, uh, a desire to try and bypass or leave out information from your kind of standard procedures? The other area that might uh, prompt some trigger points is, again, where you know some facts about a client, yeah? One of the things we, we are privy to in our space is knowing an awful lot about our clients in terms of their incomes, their assets, etc. Does their uh, possessions kind of tie in with what we know about their income and background, or do they seem disproportionate? Somebody's telling us they work in a role that's paying national average income, and yet they're riding around in an S-class Mercedes-Benz, own a property that's got, you know, 12 bedrooms and all the suites. Does, does that all tie together? Now, it might be totally legitimate because that might be a result of a legacy. So I'm not saying, once again, that these things mean they're money laundering. We must do our due diligence and enhance due diligence to make sure that we're comfortable. <clears throat> do they... Have, seem to have access to funds that can't be explained, either from their business activities, from their occupation, or from their family connections. Do they hold assets in the business which seem to serve no purpose in their normal trading activities? So to say anything stand out there, to say, you know, you're a you're a corn merchant, you know, why do you have this as a, a, an expensive kind of computer system that uh, I find you subsequently sold? <clears throat> Are you holding assets in somebody else's name, um, but it's clear they control and enjoy the benefit of them? And does there suddenly seem to be an explained uh, change in lifestyle? So this is what I said earlier about your due diligence, your risk assessment can't just be at the start of the relationship. So if as part of the client's uh, relationship you have, there's suddenly an unexplained uh, increase in spending, they've suddenly got money that they want to invest, the financial position suddenly changes, they're moving into you know much more expensive house, etc. What's going on? Why, why is that? And you know, they've suddenly taken on a huge mortgage and the affordability of that doesn't seem to match their circumstances. How can you explain all of that? So if we put that all together then in terms of our due diligence and enhanced due diligence and looking at those four areas that might trigger us to be uh, suspicious, it may well be that that prompts us to trigger a suspicious activity report. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that um, you will actually be doing. As you know, these days, it's actually done online to the National Crime Agency. <clears throat> so because all roads lead to you, you need to make the report. Yeah. So this is what your your team, your staff need to know that if they want, if they've got suspicions, they come to you in the first instance. You might well want them to put something down in terms of your own internal report so that you can have a look through that, raise any questions with them and decide what you want to do. Could be that you decide not to make a report because you're happy that you can validate the uh, reasons why and, and, and alleviate suspicions. <clears throat> But what you will be saying, as you know, to the member of your team is you're not allowed to do anything until I get back to you. So you'll have a look at that and you'll decide upon the course of action. If you do decide that this uh, merits uh, reporting, then, of course, in it goes to the National Crime Agency using the, uh, using the system there. <clears throat> and at that stage, there's a, uh, a box that you, you tick, and basically that's asking for consent to continue with advice. That's absolutely critical if you think about it, because one, this might be in all innocence, 
but until it's been fully investigated by the, uh, the relevant agencies, we won't know. Uh, but also, uh, more importantly, uh, it could trigger uh, an alert to the criminal, the criminal activity that uh, you know somebody's onto them. <clears throat> so the National Crime Agency will assess the report. They'll come back to you if they need any more detail, and then when they uh, um, make a decision, if they want to pursue it, they'll pass details to the police and other investigating authorities. Yeah, 99 times out of 100, the NCA will really want you to, um, to continue with uh, providing advice. Um, but don't worry, because at the stage that you've reported your suspicions, you've kind of covered yourself, you know, you've uh, reported your suspicions. So that the firm and yourself is going to be uh, clean in terms of that. <clears throat> Where the National Crime Office need more information, they'll serve a court order to get all relevant parties to produce information. The thing to really bear in mind, and this is key to kind of remove any concerns that your team might have about reporting money laundering, that if subsequently a prosecution ensues, then uh, any names and the evidence in terms of the uh, your suspicion report will not be revealed in court and you won't have to go to court yourself either. So that's kind of the protection that you've got under the Proceeds of Crime Act. It's what it's saying is you've discharged your obligations by reporting suspicious activity. Investigations have, have subsequently revealed that there's a case to answer here, but you're not going to get dragged into court or to have your identity revealed. <clears throat> So at that stage, what we've done is we've actually covered the key components of money laundering. We've looked at things like uh, due diligence, enhanced due diligence, who is a politically exposed person. Then we've looked at four areas where you need to be cognizant of that these could raise flags and triggers, which may lead uh, your team, your staff to report to you as the SMF. 17 for you to exercise your discretion and judgment about whether or not to report it and then how to report that on. What we're going to do now for the next uh, few minutes is to just broaden away from money laundering and look at financial crime in the round. And again, something that is very useful to you to, you to, uh, to know. So the Financial Services and Marketing Act 2000, good old FISMA, defines financial crime is anything that involves fraud, dishonesty, misconduct or misuse of information, i.e. inside dealing, whether you're handling the proceeds of crime, even inadvertently. <clears throat> and in terms of financial crime, you know, you're sitting on risk every day in day-to-day -day activity. Um, you could be um, uh, at risk of embezzlement. Um, you know, that still does happen. I was reading the uh, press just the other month and uh, Barclays uh, cashier had uh, embezzled a uh, six-figure sum by uh, taking money from a variety of different client accounts. Could be that your customers are giving false details. Harder to do these days with all the identity checks, but again, you know, it might be something that uh, they've got hold of some fraudulent ID, so you need to be alive to that risk. The thing we've been talking about for the, uh, for the last hour, about you being targeted by uh, criminals to, uh, to even inadvertently be part of their plan to get money into the system and, and launder it. <clears throat> it's where you, again, inadvertently are being targeted to try and uh, pass funds through to, to finance terrorist activity. Um, it also, as you know, goes through things like uh, data, data processing. We do a, a, another workshop on the requirements of GDPR, data, data Protection Act, and all that kind of good stuff, which makes the workshop in its own right, which includes identity fraud. So it's not just money laundering when you sit in this role. There's a whole kind of wider uh, gamut of... Uh, legislative and, and risk factors that you need to be aware of. In terms of some of the, uh, the key legislation, 
again, you don't need to, to know this, but I just think it, it's, it's important for background that people in such a senior role as SMF 17 are cognizant of. So <clears throat> the Criminal Justice Act right back in 93, actually for the first time uh, recognised the offence of insider dealing uh, and, you know, made, made that a criminal offence. We've talked a few times now about the Proceeds of Crime Act, which, which introduced criminal sanctions for money laundering activities, including, you know, failing to, to uh, report and tipping off and all that good stuff. <clears throat> and then the Fraud Act, actually, we are caught by that because, you know, if uh, we could be uh, held to account, by failing to disclose information uh, that uh, is about fraudulent activity, or we could be on the end of fraudulent activity. <clears throat> we also need to be cognizant of things like the Bribery Act, because, you know, uh, with money laundering activity, it may well be that the criminal would like to try and bribe their way into the system, be able to place funds. So, be cognizant of, of that and avoiding it and not inadvertently cross the line ourselves. <clears throat> and again, uh, we know that uh, anti-money laundering has been broadened out uh, and uh, you know, terrorism act is something that we need to be cognizant of as well, because you know that typically is around funds. And I already mentioned things like GDPR, so I think, again, we've got that all well baked into our systems these days, but, you know, that's a, a European directive that got embedded into to our law. So just a brief look at, at terrorist financing then. So <clears throat> we know from some of the commentary we're getting about the, uh, the royal funeral on, uh, on Monday that, you know, terrorist activity, there's, there's high security because terrorist activity is about trying to disrupt uh, events, services, facilities, systems, either by harming or threatening to harm or endanger people. And in order to do that, the, uh, the terrorists do require financing. So <clears throat> they can either get funds from sympathetic countries and individuals, uh, and that does still go on, but they also can generate funds for themselves through criminal activities, whether that's drug trafficking, trafficking, human smuggling, anything that you can think of here, <clears throat> or dressing up uh, businesses as, uh, as legitimate. Um, and that's why there's this parallel to, uh, to money laundering. And while the two, I think, in the eyes of the legislators and the government, have been kind of brought together. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure this is unlikely, but if you ever do have any suspicions about any of the clients that you're dealing with, you can actually get a list of possible terrorist suspects. And surprisingly, it's actually available from the Treasury. I think it would probably be at the Home Office, it isn't. Um, and actually uh, went on there and checked it out for myself to see if it really does exist, and it does. So in the unlikely event that you feel that uh, you may be being targeted, particularly to, uh, to launder some funds, you can check that out on the ATM uh, Treasury's website. <clears throat> I guess one of the reasons it's probably on the website is that they're the Treasury are the uh, the government department who's who are responsible for implementing sanctions uh, against uh, terrorist or criminal activity. So we've seen this most recently with the sanctions that have been imposed on um, some individuals from uh, from Russia uh, and they've been on the end of financial sanctions and basically what a sanction does it says that um, as a firm you can't carry out transactions even with a person or uh, an entity an organization yeah who, who may or may not be resident in in the UK so you you're subject to a sanction order um, so if if you ever if this ever happens to you, and I suggest it's, it's it's extremely unlikely. But if it does, then you'll know about it because you'll get an order from the Treasury that says you must not do business with this target unless we give you a license to continue with the transaction. And it may be 
for some reason that they feel that they want to permit access to at least a slice of the funds. But the main element, the key element, and this is the one that we've seen recently, is the total freezing of all assets. So they're totally inaccessible. Yeah. So it means that uh, not only can the target not actually access their assets, but um, nobody else who actually may control them on their behalf can access them either. So if they've set it up in trust, for example. <clears throat> and the freezing involves not just accessing funds, but any kind of alteration to that, trying to move it, transfer it, stick it into somebody else's name. None of that is actually allowed. <clears throat> and again, I say it's, it's, it's very unlikely, but if, if that happened, and whatever reason, and I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't do, you, you've, you've decided not to comply with the financial sanctions, then the bad news is that could um, lead to a custodial sentence of up to seven years and a million pounds fine. <clears throat> Moving into a slightly different area, this is around uh, tax evasion, something that uh, the government has, has uh, beefed up in the Criminal Finances Act 2017, which amended POCA. Um, and it, what it was trying to do with this act was to improve our ability, not just to tackle money laundering, but also uh, tax evasion. Uh, and it created two uh, new criminal offences, one pertinent to UK tax evasion and one to non-UK. And we'll just have a very quick overview of these. So you could be uh, guilty of tax evasion if you commit an offence anywhere in the world that, um, that has led to evading UK tax, yeah? So you'll be deemed to have a connection to the UK if you're incorporated in the UK, have a place of business in the UK, or the offence occurs in the UK, yeah? So this is this you could fall foul of this if you're dealing with a corporate entity uh, or an individual who, for whatever reason, has decided to evade tax, uh, and you have inadvertently uh, become culpable in that. <clears throat> um, where tax, uh, where, where those criteria don't apply and tax evaded is, is not in the UK, um, then that liability will only apply if, a, if an offence has occurred when there's a UK uh, connection. And I suggest this is kind of quite uh, esoteric, really, uh, and unlikely on a day-to-day -day basis, something that uh, you will have uh, any experience of. <clears throat> In terms of, of, of bribery, yeah, as you can see there, the, 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 the definition in the Act is an offer or receipt of financial or any other advantages. So it needn't just be hard cash. It could be if you do this, you could be the chair of this body, or you could have this uh, this role, or whatever. Some sort of inducement that's trying to compel you to commit some sort of um, dishonest or trust breaching act. Yeah, the key thing about bribery is you don't actually have to receive anything. It, you could have just received an offer, and that's what the bribery act said. It's um, it's either the offering or giving of a bribe receiving or agreeing to receive. You don't need to actually actually benefited from it. You're just given kind of a nod, even inadvertently. Trying to bribe a public official, or again, this is your role, you fail to prevent bribery being undertaken within the firm. <clears throat> now, again, I suggest it's extremely unlikely. Cover it for thoroughness because money laundering you know, it's something that maybe um, people are susceptible to being bribed about. <clears throat> Quickly talking about conflicts of interest. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but basically uh, what, what conflict of interest is that should be avoided from your and your firm's perspective is to doing something that may not be aligned to the absolute interests of uh, the clients that they're dealing with. So... <clears throat> You shouldn't be doing anything that uh, alters either your own conduct or the decision of yourself or others because you've got an undue conflict of interest. 
uh, there were some um, cases of this actually with some firms over in Wales who um, had done something around pension transfers, um, whilst they were actually sitting as discretionary fund managers uh, at some very esoteric and high risk investments and persuading British steel workers to invest in that clear conflict of interest that they fell foul of. I'm sure that doesn't happen to anybody on this particular call. So in sum then, uh, as we've seen, money laundering and the associated apps within money laundering are criminal offences. And it's imperative that you understand your obligations as an F-17, not only that you're an accountable individual, but you make everybody within the firm aware of their responsibilities under money laundering and the, and the penalties that may flow from that. So it's important that they understand from you all about anti-money laundering, what your systems and processes are, and in particular, what the chosen due diligence requirements are for your firm and when enhanced due diligence needs to kick in because it, it reflects a higher degree of risk and what your risk appetite is in terms of how far you want to push that. It's critical that all roads lead to you as the MLRO so that everybody within the firm, however uh, tenuous their suspicion is, actually feels that they uh, you are approachable and they want to talk to you about it uh, and for you to exercise your wisdom, your judgment and decide whether or not to take it on. So it's essential that you understand your obligations, not just about money laundering, but terrorist financial financing. And in particular, the financial sanctions regime in the unlikely event that you're asked to do that. <clears throat> so in terms of actually the, the content, as I said, I thought we'd run about uh, an hour and 15 and we have. For those of you who um, need to take the uh, test, you'll find it in the BAT system. If you look at the, uh, the TNC section, go to financial exams and you'll find the test there. Hopefully, what you'll also find at that section of the system is a number of documents that you can actually download, which actually goes into quite some detail around money laundering. So even if you haven't got to do the test, it might be worth going into the system and drawing down those, uh, those documents and having them in your file and they could form the basis of a, of a good training session with your staff. <clears throat> so at the start of the session, we said we'd look at the uh, responsibilities required of uh, an SMF 17. And we also have a look at things like prescribed responsibilities. So we lifted the bonnet on that. Yeah. <clears throat> We also said, OK, let's have a look at your responsibilities for compliance uh, and all that entails around both anti-money laundering and terrorist financing legislation. <clears throat> and we went into detail on what process of we define money laundering, what the uh, elements of money laundering are and everything that kind of flowed from that. We looked at due diligence and then where applicable enhanced due diligence looked at who constitutes a politically exposed person that would uh, require enhanced due diligence. And then we looked at some areas that uh, might trigger alerts that activity was suspicious, uh, might flag concerns. And then if those concerns kind of crystallize your role in being the focal point on it, how your team, how your staff report that to you, on what you would need to do in terms of reporting it onto the National Crime Agency. And then the final kind of 10 minutes, all we've done is we've just brought it off for your awareness, um, you know, the breadth of financial crime offences that you just need to be cognizant of, really, uh, which will help you kind of mitigate risks within the firm. Okay, so finally then, for those of you who would like uh, a... Uh, evidence uh, by way of a CPD certificate. Those are my contact details there. So you can uh, do a screen capture or a photograph or good old pen and paper and scribble that down. And I can send you a, uh, a CPD certificate for uh, an hour and a half. 
<clears throat> for those of you who need to um, to get on and do the test, I would suggest that you know nothing is uh, you know strike while the iron's hot. While all that information is at the front of your mind, uh, it will take you less than ten minutes to do the test. It took me uh, less than five minutes yesterday to do that test, um, and we definitely covered all the information that we need there. Good. So. <clears throat> With that in mind, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank everybody for uh, for your attention. For those of you who've signed up to Consumer Duty next week, look forward to uh, to seeing you on that one. Some some new uh, content for us to get our head into next week, which will be fun. Uh, have a brilliant rest of the day, and uh, I'll uh, I'll look forward to seeing a lot of you next week. So uh, bye for now, everybody.